love this miracle, and I think that I know this miracle because I feel like I participated in it about every evening that our family sat down to have dinner at the Galka household. There were ten kids in the family and mom and dad, and I remember a couple of things. I remember one night, uh, we were never poor, but we were never rich. We always had enough. But I do remember one day mom making the meatloaf, and she kept tearing up more and more pieces of bread to put it in with the hamburger. And I said, Mom, I thought it was called meatloaf, not breadloaf. And she said, the bread makes it taste better. And I believed that. That's all that I knew at the time. I also remember that you knew dinner was coming when Mom and Dad would both yell, everybody sit down. And I think I saw that in the miracle today when Jesus had 5,000 men, maybe another 10, 15,000 women and children. So how do you get crowd control? Everybody sit down. That's how Mom and Dad controlled us as a crowd. If we were sitting around the table, then they could at least have some control over what was going to happen. But if we weren't sitting around the table, then havoc was going to break loose. So I love this miracle. I think our first instinct is to wonder, how did this miracle happen exactly? I mean, Jesus said after he blessed and broke it, he gave it to the disciples and he said, give it away. What happened there? Did the disciples hand out a loaf of bread and look back and suddenly there was more? Did the people receive a loaf of bread and then suddenly it just grew and increased? The scriptures tell us nothing about exactly how it happened, but they do give us some very important details. So I'd like to begin with a couple of those. First of all, when Jesus heard of the death of John the Baptist, he withdrew to a deserted place. This isn't just geography, this is also spirituality. When Jesus heard of the death of his cousin, John the Baptist was beheaded just in the previous chapter by Herod. Jesus withdrew to a deserted place. He was empty. He was sad. He was lonely. I bet he was a little bit afraid. The authorities had just killed his cousin. They might come looking for him. If you read the Gospels again and again, Jesus puts himself in a place of emptiness or he puts himself in a place of brokenness. So what happens when Jesus puts himself in a deserted place? That's how he's feeling inside spiritually. And as soon as Jesus goes there, who does he find? A whole crowd of people who are also hungry and empty and deserted inside. They're looking for something. So maybe that's the first spiritual lesson for us. In your life, when you feel empty, when you feel deserted, when you feel like you need something more, and you wonder, where is God? The Gospels promise us Jesus is waiting in those deserted places. He has not abandoned us. He's waiting for us there. And in fact, uh, when you put yourself into a deserted place and when you look for the Lord, then a miracle can happen. So you get ready for it because that's where they happen. A second detail. The disciples see a problem. And what is their response? They respond, dismiss the crowds, so they can go to the villages and buy some food for themselves. The disciples look and they see not enough. And they think the answer is just to go and buy something else. In the scriptures, sin is defined as anything that separates. In fact, the Greek word for separate is diabolina. In Spanish, it's diablo. In English, it's devil. So what does the word devil literally mean in the scriptures? One who separates. That's the work of sin. So here you have the disciples who see a problem, and what's their first reaction? Separate everybody. Send them off. How does divine love and compassion respond when sin enters the picture? Jesus says, no. Gather them together. Have them sit down together in groups. This is divine love. Divine compassion always responds by saying, when there's trouble, don't run away. When there's trouble, it's not every person for themselves. When there's trouble, we look out for each other with generosity, with compassion, and with love. So that's the second spiritual message that I see there. The voice of grace, we bear each other's burdens with love. 
You don't let people be alone and separated. Jesus is the voice of communion. He's the voice of compassion. He keeps them together. Now is when we hang together. Also, I'm struck by that line, another detail, probably the most powerful line. Jesus looks at the disciples and he says to them, you give them something to eat. This is a huge shift. The disciples had been operating by looking and saying, we don't have enough. Jesus looks and he sees the exact same thing, the exact same situation, the exact same resources, and what does Jesus see? He sees plenty. We have plenty of time. We have plenty of resources. We have plenty of what we need. The Catechism of the Catholic Church has a great word that they say again and again when we refer to the nature of God, and that word is the superabundance of God. The disciples looked and they saw not enough. Jesus looked and he saw superabundance. This is an important step in the spiritual life. When we look into our own lives, do you see not enough? Are you just aware of what your neighbor has and what you don't have? Are you resentful because you didn't get that gift? The scriptures tell us clearly a better step is to look inside and say, what do I have? What are the gifts that God has given to me? And when the disciples looked at what they had, what did they have? Five loaves and two fish. Numbers in the Bible are important. What is five plus two? Everybody say it. Seven is a powerful word that means fullness, but in the scriptures, seven also means this is a gift of God. So Jesus looked at what they had and he saw a gift of God. And if you have a gift of God, it's going to be enough. So how do you live your life? Do you focus on what you don't have? Or do you recognize that everything you've been given is a gift of God? And it's probably more than I know, definitely more than I deserve. And if I let God in the picture, it's going to be more than I need. I think another part of this step of the miracle you have a role to play in God's plan of salvation. When you pray about your emptiness, do you just say, God, here's my problem, do something with it, fix it. And then do you sit there and wait for God to do it? Jesus looks you in the eye and says, you give them something to eat. You have a part to play in God's history of salvation. So stop waiting for food to fall from the sky. Stop waiting for the miracle to happen. Start sharing the gifts you've been given. Be a good steward of the gifts God has given to you. Participate in the miracle. Don't sit around waiting for it. You have a job to do. And lastly, I notice the verbs. And when you listen to these verbs, picture in a few moments what we're going to say and do at this table right here. Taking the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up to heaven, Jesus said the blessing, broke the loaves, gave them to his disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate, and they were all satisfied. This is about the Eucharist. In a few minutes, Jesus will take the loaves that you present to him. He will look up to heaven himself. He will say the blessing himself. He will break the bread himself, which becomes himself, he will give himself to the crowds, and in turn, you will give him to each other. We will all eat, and we will be satisfied. On the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, there's a little chapel where people believe this miracle took place. It's called the little village of Tabga. And when you walk into that chapel, you see the altar, and on the floor right in front of the altar, there's a mosaic. And in the mosaic, you see a basket, and in the basket, you see four loaves of bread and two fish. How many loaves of bread were in the miracle? Five. Where's the fifth loaf of bread? The people believe that as soon as the Eucharist begins, you carry that loaf of bread, you place it on the altar, and then the miracle continues. Every time you celebrate the Eucharist, our God continues to meet us in a deserted place. Our God continues to feed us what we truly need. Our God continues to invite you to gratitude and awareness of what you've been given 
then our God feeds you, then he asks you to go and do the same. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.